Today, I'm going to preach, um, first of all, I, I won't say that, I'm going to preach today. I just feel such a passion for what God wants to put in, has put in my heart, and um, a lot of times I love to teach, but today I just, I just want you to get what I feel in my heart today, and so uh, if you, you want to shout and amen and clap and all that, you, you go right ahead and have yourself a time. Uh, but the second thing I, I want to say to you is this, that um, I am going to, to, to come today from my favorite passage in all of Scripture, John chapter 21. It's my favorite passage. Um, in all of scripture and I'd love for you to turn there and follow me. We're in this series called Tough Love, Tough Love and here, here's how it came about. Um, I was driving down the road one day and uh, the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart, not an audible, just, just a, a quiet voice and I heard him say out of nowhere, I'm going to teach you how to love. And it kind of struck me as odd because I kind of consider myself, uh, you know, a very loving person. But what has happened for me over the last few weeks is I've just learned that I'm not near as loving as I thought I was. And um, it reminds me of a Peanuts cartoon. Uh, Lucy is standing there with a scowl on her face, and Charlie Brown walks up to her. And, and he's, he sees this scowl, and her arms crossed, and he says, Lucy, the world needs more love. You need to be more loving. And immediately she swings around and punches him right in the face and he falls on the ground and she says, listen, blockhead, the world I love, it's people I can't stand. <laughs> and I just thought, no true words have I ever lived over these last few weeks than just this idea that, man, I, I thought I loved everybody, but until you really start to look at how your love stacks up to the way Jesus calls us to love, Man, there's a big difference, and, um, and, and that's kind of a l little bit of the reality, the conundrum of, of just this, this love message is it's easy to talk about, but it's hard to walk in, and the reason it's so difficult to love at Jesus' level is, frankly, he just sets the bar really high. You know, if you read 1 Corinthians 13, which I'm sure you've heard at, at many weddings, I just, just let me read it to you. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And you've heard that in poetic moments at weddings, but, but when you take it off of the ceremony and lay it onto your life, here's the reality. I can't keep that standard. I mean, when I read that and I think to myself, I, I, I can't do that. It's just too high a bar. And I know for, for, for some of you, this is probably the part of the sermon where you would expect me to say, yes, you can. I believe in you. If you try hard enough, you can do it. But listen to me. I'm going to be honest with you today. You can't do it. You, you can't. You don't have the capacity. Some of you are like, I'm, I'm just grateful I came to church today. So encouraging. <laughs> Listen, you can't do it. The most loving person in this room can't keep that standard. And that's some of the struggle when it comes to love is, is that we know there's a bar, but yet we've discovered pretty quickly that we don't have the capacity to get to the bar. And I, I, I know for us, I, I felt it in our marriage it was early in our marriage, and, you know, you're kind of learning one another, and you're learning really how to love. And, and I just remember we entered into a season of struggle. And like many seasons of struggle in marriage, it really boils down to this, is that um, you're trying to meet one another's expectations. I'm trying to provide what Kayla needs. Kayla's trying to provide what I need. And then we were just really bad at it. We weren't patient and protecting. We were just angry and list keepers, you know. And, and um, you know, it, 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 we're just so different. Kayla wanted me to come home after a day at work to sit across from her, hold her hands, look in her eyes, and pour out my heart for hours. I wanted to watch football. We were just not on the, we were just weren't on the same page. And, and the more that I didn't meet her needs, the more she didn't meet my needs, it just got worse. And I, I just remember having this frustration of feeling like I just don't have what she needs. It's not in me. And, and I remember one day when I, I, I truly I just felt like a, a failure as a husband. I remember praying just almost a, an exasperated prayer of, God, wh why did you marry, put Kayla and I together if I don't have what she needs? And I remember the Holy Spirit just gently saying in my heart, I have what she needs. And I thought, well, then you should have married her. 
But it was at that moment that I started to discover the secret to loving. The secret to loving. That's the title of today's message, The Secret to Loving. And and let me explain it this way. The Bible says God is love. Not that he is loving, he is love. It's his nature. That he's never done anything loving, just whatever he's done is love. And and so, so realizing God is love and realizing that I am not God, it means he's got something that I don't have. And if I'm going to give what I don't have to someone else, I've got to first get it from God who possesses it all. See, see, you can't give away love you've never received. And that's why the secret to love is really boiled down to this. The secret to loving someone else is first receiving God's love for yourself. The secret to, for any person, for, for you to love anyone else, you've got to first receive it from God for yourself. And and, and scripture backs that up in 1 John 4, 19 when it says, we love because he first loved us. That that I don't even know how. I don't even have the capacity. I can't provide love without first receiving it from Christ. And so so if I want to love like Jesus loves, which is the goal of this whole series, then I've got to receive from Jesus the love that only he can give. Because here's the reality. I've just learned my love runs out. And if you've ever been in traffic, you've learned your love runs out. I I mean, my love runs out. It's impatient. It, it, It won't wait on anybody else. It wants what it wants now. My love has limits. There is only a certain level to which I'm going to put up with it or that I'm going to extend myself. It just my love runs aground. But here's what I've learned. God's love doesn't do that. And when I let God love me, you would be shocked at how patient I'll become for you. When I've let God love me, I'll go further, do more, I'll serve more, give more, I'll encourage more. When I've received God's love for myself, it's amazing how I can keep showing up again and again and again and again to love unlovable people because there's been so much love poured into me. So the secret, the secret to loving, whether you're here today and and you're struggling with your spouse, or whether you're here and and you're just struggling to, to, to just even like not want to commit workplace violence. If you're here today and you need to love more, the secret to loving someone else is first receiving God's love for yourself because you can't give what you don't have. Now, here, here's, here's what I've discovered, though. I, I've been working with people long enough that I've realized that many people the biggest obstacle they have to becoming a loving person is they cannot receive God's love. There's a lot of people that want to be loving and want to be more kind and more patient, more long. They want to do it, but they can't because they can't receive God's love. And here's what I I found. Many people don't receive God's love because they carry too much regret. You see, the fact is, love doesn't fail, but you figured out already, we do. And what you do with your failures determines how you receive love from thereafter. Because the truth is, when I've had some of the biggest mess-ups in my life, there is a voice that settles deep in my heart, and here's what it says, because of your failure, you're no longer lovable. I mean, there's some people that are not here today. And you know why they're not here? Not because they didn't want to be here, because when they woke up this morning, there was a voice inside of them that said, because of what you did last night, you better not show up at church this morning. There's some people that you failed with your kids this week. And, 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 and there's just that voice on the inside that says, hey, you know, you're, you're creating monsters. You, you, you're not loving them. You're, and, and that regret hangs heavy. It's like, it's like it, just, it hangs around your neck. It hangs on your heart. And before long, you start to believe that you're not good enough, that you're, you, you, you messed up in every way, that you are no longer lovable. And let me just say, if you don't think you're lovable, you can't receive God's love, which means you can't love anybody else. And so today, I I, kind of want to address that. I want to address the biggest obstacle, that voice that so fills us with regret, that so fills us with shame and condemnation, that keeps us as 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 a wall up to receiving God's love. And there's no better place to do that than in my favorite chapter in all of Scripture, John 21. 
Now, let me say up front that there really shouldn't be a John 21. So well, that's odd, but l- let me explain. Um, there really shouldn't be a John 21. When John, the apostle who lived with Jesus, wrote his gospel, the accounts of Jesus, um, chapter 20 does a pretty great job of summing it all up. As a matter of fact, it, it, it really wraps it up in a nice little bow. For, for instance, if you read John 20, you would quickly see that, that John 20 includes Jesus being raised from the dead, resurrecting, appearing victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and allowing us to walk into eternal life. You would also find in John 20 that Jesus appears to the disciples, even the most doubting of disciples. Most of them, he appears to them, and he ignites such faith in them. They go from fear to faith that they are now ready to carry the gospel around the world. If you even read the last few verses of John chapter 20, you'll see that it's just perfectly put together to where we just don't need John chapter 21. Like, like, let me read you the last couple verses of John 20, and look at how it just wraps a bow on this gospel. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I mean, that's a great ending. If I was John, I would say, Let's close it. Send it to publish. I mean, it is, this is a great ending. There's no need. John chapter 20 puts a bow on it, wraps it up in a perfect way. And yet, there is a John chapter 21. And, and what's really funny, as you're going to see, is that John chapter 21 is not for the world. John chapter 20, 21 is not for all of Jesus' followers. It, it, it doesn't address major human issues. John chapter 21 is for one single person. The whole chapter is for one person. One single person this whole chapter is written for, and the man who goes by the name of Peter. Now, you you may remember Peter. Peter was the um, outspoken, outlandish, always out front disciple that Jesus chose. Peter was always in the middle of miracles. I mean, it was Peter who walked on, walked on water. It was Peter who makes some of the greatest claims. It's Peter who also makes some of the biggest mess-ups. I mean, Peter, there's more on Peter than almost anybody else in the Gospels other than Jesus. I mean, Peter is this bold leader who Jesus says, I will build my church on your confession. But in John chapter 21, that's not the Peter we find. In John 21, the Peter we find is a broken man. A man who's hiding in isolation, a man who's no longer proclaiming God's love, but literally believes he's unlovable. You see, to give you a little context, it's in John chapter 13 that Jesus pulls together all of his disciples, including Peter, and he says to them, guys, I want to let you in on what's about to happen to me. And, And he goes on to explain that he's about to be arrested, that because of fear, his disciples, the guys he's talking to, will abandon him. And that he, in fact, will be crucified. And in a moment of misplaced boldness, Peter steps up in the middle of Jesus unpacking this plan and says, that's not going to happen. As I will not let this happen, and I'll never abandon you. And Jesus, knowing Peter's frailty, looks at Peter in the eyes and says, Peter, not only are you going to abandon me, you're going to deny that you even knew me. Peter doesn't believe it, but I, if you've got to go with, between Peter and Jesus, I'm going to go with Jesus. Turns out a few hours later, Jesus is arrested. And the Bible says that Peter follows at distance until he arrives at the courtyard of the building that Jesus is being held in for the religious trials. And the Bible says that Peter's hanging around, but as he's hanging around trying to see what will happen to Jesus, fear starts to grow in his heart. And and all of a sudden, a junior high girl, probably no more than age 13 or 14, looks and notices Peter. She's probably seen him at some of Jesus' miracle moments. And she says to him, hey, don't I know you? Aren't you one of Jesus' followers? And without even thinking, the Bible says that Peter immediately denies that he ever knew Jesus. But it gets worse. Peter moves across the courtyard, and the Bible says that he's standing over a fire, trying to warm himself, waiting to see what happens for Jesus when someone else recognizes him. And this time when someone recognizes him, they ask the same question. Hey, aren't you, aren't you the, one of those followers of the man they've arrested? Don't you know that Jesus? And immediately Peter says, no, I don't know him, never met him, don't even have a clue who he is, and denies him again. 
Then Peter moves across the fire to where he's looking at, at the building now, and finally one more person recognizes him, and this time Peter explodes when questioned. And he begins to deny Jesus publicly so that everybody can hear. And the Bible says he even goes as far to curse Jesus. And in only a way that could be divinely orchestrated by the hand of God, at the moment the words leave his mouth, a door to the court swings open, and there stands Jesus looking eye to eye across the fire at Peter, hearing the curse words that just left his mouth. Immediately the weight of regret that falls on Peter is unbearable. It crushes his soul. He has betrayed his friend. He has rejected his teacher. And he has turned his back on his God and and literally sees him face to face across the fire. And um, the Bible says in Luke that the result of this is that Peter wept bitterly. And this mighty man of God all of a sudden runs away and returns to his former life fishing. Peter was supposed to be the guy they built the church on, and now he's cleaning fish, hiding in regret. Peter's certain that he's now unlovable, and so he just goes back to what he knows. This is the guy who was supposed to write about love, and instead he's written himself out of God's love. And I assure you in that moment, had Peter had editing rights to John's gospel, he would have said, John... Shut it down at chapter 20. John, I'm telling you, there's nothing more. I'm unlovable. There's no use in a chapter 21. But I am so encouraged that the Holy Spirit is the only person who owns the editing rights to our story. And the Holy Spirit spoke into John's ear and said, chapter 20 is not all there's going to be. Turn the page. I'm not done with Peter. And I just sense him saying that over so many lives here today. Turn the page on addiction. Turn the page on that failed marriage. Turn the page on what's broken in them. I'm not done with them yet. I got a little bit more story to write. I'm going to write more of my love into their life. And so John chapter 21 is for people who who have failed. It's for people like me. It's for people like Peter. It's for people who need to know how to receive God's love so that they can release God's love into others around them. And so I want to read you John 21, just just, just so you see the story, and then I'll make a few comments. John 21, 4 says, Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples, a few of them with Peter, did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, um, they were unable to haul in the net because it was so large, such a large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him saying, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped in the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, towing a net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire burning, a fire burning of coals, and and there were some fish on it, and there was also some bread. And I'm, I'm certain if Peter was here today and he was to unpack for you how to receive God's love in the wake of regret, he would he would give you these four things. So if you're here today in the wake of regret from this weekend, in the wake of regret from this year, in the wake of regret from this decade. I'm going to show you how to receive God's love today. Here's the very first thing. The first thing is you have to realize God has never left you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've done to others, God's never left you. See, um, one of the most interesting things that John gives us, if you read the whole passage, is he tells us who's with Peter. And turns out that Peter has, when he decided to, to leave, he also brought along with him several disciples. And John names them specifically, John, James, Nathaniel, and Thomas. And it's an important detail for this reason because in John chapter 20, Jesus found the disciples minus Peter and he appeared to them. John chapter 20 tells us that not only did he appear to them, that he literally let them put their hands in his side where he had been stabbed, put their hands in his, in his nail wounds, that, that Jesus is showing that he is resurrected completely. 
And so the reason this is important is because the four people that are on the boat with Peter have already seen the resurrected Jesus. And undoubtedly, they have told Peter, Jesus is alive. And that's an important thing to remember for this reason. Peter is not fishing because he thinks Jesus is dead. Peter is fishing because he thinks his relationship with Jesus is dead. See, regret is a very skilled liar. Regret is so skilled at lying that it will make you believe that because of what you've done, God has abandoned you. And as Peter's standing there, hearing that Jesus is in fact alive from the disciples, what he hears through regret is, you abandoned Jesus, now Jesus has abandoned you. Because of what you've done, Jesus is keeping a distance. And he hears everything that's a fact as an indictment on his own life that because of what he's done, he's no longer lovable, and the God who he once claimed to love is now distanced from him. But listen to me, while regret is standing in Peter's ear, Jesus is standing on the shore. Because Jesus is not going to let a promise fall to the ground. And the most overwhelming, the most stated again and again, the most repeated promise in all of Scripture is this. I am with you. God says it again and again and again. In the moments of your highest achievement and in the moments of the depths of your despair, I am with you. You know why that's an incredible promise? Is not only does God promise that he's with us, <laughs> he also says that he sees everything about us. You know what that means? God says that there's never been a moment of your life that he's not seen what you did and knew what you were thinking. God sees you completely. Think, think about this for just a second. God has seen every action you've ever taken, and he knows every thought you've ever thunk. Whew. Now, th think about it. Let's say that, that this Sunday we decided to do something special beside crazy sweaters. Here's what we did. What if there was a machine that somehow we could observe your life for the last 48 hours? Not only could we see all your actions, but we could also somehow, we, we could categorize all of your thoughts. And we're going to collect all of your actions and all of your thoughts from the last 48 hours. And guess what we're going to do on Sunday? We're going to project them on the screen for everybody to see. We're just going to review all your actions and thoughts. The ones you thought nobody saw, the ones that were late at night, the ones that were early in the morning, the, the ones you thought when you were standing by them and you were smiling, but you were thinking wasn't smiley. We're just going to project all of them. We're going to project every selfish act, every lustful thought, every greedy thought, every harsh action, every one of them. We're going to project them from the, just the last 48 hours. Let me tell you, if we did that, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, you ain't going to have no friends. If, if we were to project just the last 48 hours of everything you thought and everything you did, no one would want to be with you. No one would want to be with me. Everyone would abandon us. Listen to me. God saw everything, including every thought, and he hasn't considered one time abandoning you. What love? <laughs> it's one thing to love someone in ignorance. It's another thing to see them exactly as they are in every way and in, in the awful things they think and say, I'm not going anywhere. And that, that's what the power of Jesus standing on the shore is, is that we think that sin and our struggles pushes God's back. It push God's back. Listen to me. You're just not that sinful. 
you don't have that strong a struggle. If you tried, you can't push God away. His love is so persistent, it's so resolute, it is so tenacious in its pursuit of you. God's love is downright stubborn in the way that it will not leave you, it will not abandon you, it will not go anywhere except for where you go. And on days that you thought it was gone, it was there. And on days that you needed it the most, it was there. And on days when you were at your worst, it was standing there. And on days that you were at your best, it was standing there. There has not been a second of a day, a breath of life that's ever left you that God himself has not loved you and that love pursued you and that love drawed you and that love resumed, like, just persevered for you. There's not been a moment. And it's no different in Peter's life. Jesus is standing on the shore. The chapter has been written. The purpose has been fulfilled. And yet for one person... Jesus stands on the shore because you, you got to remember, <laughs> God has never left you. The second thing Peter would tell you is this, you need to resist the urge to earn that love. Um, when the Bible says that Peter recognized Jesus standing on the shore, the Bible says that, that Peter did two things. The first thing that Peter did is it says he put on his outer garment. Now, um, and it also says he swam to shore. Now, you may interpret these as, as just reactions of excitement, but the truth is, is that this is, Jesus, this is Peter trying to earn Jesus' approval. See, the outer garment would have been the finest piece of clothing that Peter owned. And the reason he's taking it off, if you remember, he was at a meal, Passover meal with Jesus. So he was dressed for dinner. And then after everything that happened, he abandons to fishing. And so it's like you wearing a tuxedo to go into a rowboat. And so he gets out there and he, he kind of strips down, putting the best he's got to the side. And so the minute he sees Jesus, he goes and grabs his best and puts it on. It's a way of him dressing up. It's a way of him saving face. It's a way of him trying to make himself more presentable on the outside because he's known what he's did on the inside. And not only that, the Bible says that he jumped in the water and starts swimming to Jesus. And it's really, you know, not a noble thing he's doing. What he's trying to do is he's trying to prove, Jesus, I'm more committed. I'm more zealous. I'm more hardworking. Those other guys, they'll stay in the boat, Jesus, but not me. I'm going to jump out here. And even though I messed up, I am going to stroke my way. I'm going to strive my way. I'm going to try to show you, to demonstrate to you, to show you that I can earn your approval back. And so Peter makes it to shore, and the Bible says he even not only swims to shore, he drags the whole net of fish up. <laughs> Must have been exhausting. <laughs> because slavery is exhausting. And that's the way a lot of us approach our relationship with God, like we're slaves, performing for our master's approval. That's what Peter's just trying to, he's just trying to do anything. Hey, Jesus, see, I'm still working hard. Hey, Jesus, I'm still trying. Hey, Jesus, I'm going to work harder than I did before. I know I messed up, but I'm going to try harder this time, Jesus. He's just displaying that he's willing to work harder, and it's exhausting. And, and if you live like that, you know it's exhausting. It's exhausting trying to do everything right and trying to avoid everything bad just so God will love you. It's exhausting. It reminds me, um, if you spent an evening with Kayla, um, the reality is, is that at some point she would work into the conversation um, her, her former youth pastor. Um, she grew up in a youth group, and I, I'm just telling you, um, Rod Justice made an indelible mark on Kayla's life. She thinks he's a superhero. And, um, and one of the things that he formed in her is this just real strong belief that when it came to dating, she doesn't do any of the work. The guy does all the work. She just, that means Kayla ain't going to work and call me. When we were dating, she didn't call me. When we were dating, she didn't invite me out. When we were dating, she, she, did, like, she didn't plan anything. There's going to be some work. I'll do the work. I'm, that's not her job. That means I opened every door. I, means, I mean, she's standing outside of a closed door just waiting for me to come back and open it. I mean, I paid for every meal. I planned everything. I made it all happen. Because in Kayla's mind, she had been taught so clearly 
My role was to do the work. Her role was to receive the love. And in Kayla's mind, I exist to do the work. She exists to receive the love. And I'm just telling you, it would do some of you good to remember Jesus' role is to do the work. Your job to receive the love. His job to do the work. He already did it all. He came from, earth. He came from heaven to earth. He lived the perfect life. He's the one that did the teaching. He's the one that lived the example. He's the one that died. He's the one that hung on the cross. He's the one that went in the grave. He's the one that defeated hell and death. He's the one that got out of the grave. He's the one that sent the Holy Spirit. He does the work. We receive the love. We don't, why are you trying to earn something God's already paid for? Was the cross not enough? God thought it was. Your job's to receive the love. Your job's not to earn God's love, it's to enjoy God's love. You have a father who adores you, who waits for your first breath every morning. You have a father who is redeemed and bought and provided and protected and even in the midst of your rejection of him, he has adored you. You don't have to earn anything. You just gotta enjoy it. Just enjoy it. Not only that Peter would tell us then, he'd say after you learn that, he says you need to resume a daily relationship. And this is my favorite part, John 21, 12. It says, Jesus said to him, come and have breakfast. I love this. I love it. Peter has swam to shore. Peter has put on his best. Peter's dragged the net up there. And, you know, and, he's, and in the back of his mind, you know he's preparing himself for the lecture. He's preparing for the, for the, the chastisement. He's, he's just bracing himself. And the first words out of Jesus' mouth are, hey, let's have breakfast together. I love this. I mean, I love it on one end because now Peter is face to face with the man he betrayed. He's face to face with the friend he betrayed. He's face to face with the God he rejected. I love it. And on another end, it kind of bothers me because I, I'm asking, what? Breakfast? Where's the berating? Where, where's the lecture? Where's the, you didn't get this right? Where's the uh, uh, finger wagging? Where's the you, you should have? Where is all that? Why is there no punishment? Because Jesus is not into reviewing wrongs. He's into restoring relationships. Amen. He already knows what we did wrong. What's the point in pulling it back out? And, and I love how God puts this together because the last time Jesus' eyes connected with Peter's eyes over a fire was when Peter denied and cursed him. It's almost as if God is saying, hey, we're, we're not just going to come together and, and have a lecture. I want to recreate a similar moment. And so here stands Peter looking across the fire just like he had days earlier, seeing Jesus that he had cursed, seeing Jesus that he denied. And yet Jesus doesn't blink. He just looks right at Peter. You know what that is? That is Jesus showing Peter, I am not afraid to get into the greatest failures of your life. It, this is not something we just have to, we're we going we to put under the rug. This is not something that we, we just won't speak about. I have no problem sitting here looking at you, reminding you of your greatest failures, and still showing you I love you. You know why? Because the moment, we, we just, we're so off in the way that we think about failure. We think that our failures makes, makes God cut us off. Our failures, the moment they happen, God puts a plan into action that brings us back. That, that's what, for, for instance, um, before Peter even got to the fishing boat, God had already sent a message to Peter to come back into relationship. You don't believe it? Mark chapter 16, verse 7. Look at this. An angel is literally standing Sunday morning at the resurrection. Jesus is just a few feet down the road, and some followers show up, and here's what the angel says. Jesus has ridden, risen. Go tell his disciples and Peter. And Peter. You know why? Because Jesus has no problem knowing Peter will fail. And the moment Peter failed, the moment before he even got to the boat, there was already a plan pursuing to bring him back into relationship. 
I'm telling you, the moment you failed, God had already hit a button to start a plan to bring you back into relationship. For some of you, God planned this church service before you were born to bring you back into relationship. He planned this message before you even messed up and did what you did to bring you back into relationship. That's what he cares about. L listen, listen, the last time, why did, why did Jesus choose breakfast? I mean, I, I'm sure he loves waffles and all, but I'm just saying, like, why? Like, like I think of all the things that Jesus could have done. He could have displayed his, his sovereignty. He could have, he, could have, he could have displayed his authority. He could have shown his scars. He could have done a miracle. I mean, he could have done anything. He could have taught. He could, yeah, I mean, think, but he chooses breakfast. You know why? Because the last meaningful moment before his crucifixion that he shared with Peter was over a meal. At Passover, before all the failure, it was just Jesus and Peter having a meal. It was just two friends having a meal. It, it, it was just a master and a teacher enjoying a relationship. And so when Jesus comes to pursue Peter, he says, you know what? I'm just going to do what will let us go back to where we were. I'm not going to get into the lists and the whatevers and the what you should have. I'm just going to, I, I want to do this. I want to create a moment where Peter knows that, that, that we're just going to pick up where we left off. <laughs> you know, that's what God's saying to you today, right? Let's just pick up where we left off. Let, let's not get into the, let's, let's not get into the what happened. Let's not get into where you messed up. Let's not get into what you looked at. Let's not get into who, who, the secret. Let's not get into what you said about them. Let's not get in. My grace is so bountiful. It'll allow us to just pick up where we left off. To just pick up when you, you remembered I loved you. To just pick up when we, we spent that time in the morning together. But just to pick up when you loved my word. Let's just, let's just pick up where we left off. We don't have to talk about all the other. Let's just pick up where we left off. And, and I think this illustrates just a powerful point, which is love is giving a person what they need, not what they deserve. Jesus had breakfast with Peter because Peter needed breakfast with Jesus. He needed it. Let me give you the last one. After you've received this love, the only reasonable thing to do is to release the love you've received. To release it. And that's what Jesus' whole end game was. That's why there is a John 21. In verse 15, it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, okay. Then, receive, then, then feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. You say, well, what does that mean exactly? Um, Jesus is basically saying, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, of course. He says, Peter, do you receive my love? Is it enough for you that I showed up on this, this beach to show you how much? I, I, absolutely. Then here's what I need you to do, Peter. I need you to care for the young believers that will come behind you. I'm leaving, Peter. And remember when I told you you're going you're gonna to lead this church? I need you to do that. I need you to feed them. I need you to care for them. I need you to keep them in line. Peter, I need you to love. I need you to take this love that you've received, Peter, and I need you to love those that are coming behind you. Now, I think in that moment, if you read the whole thing, I think this was the thing Peter struggled with the most. He knew Jesus could love him, but he didn't think because of his failure he could represent Jesus' love. It's almost as if he was like, Jesus, Jesus, you're not thinking right. I, get, I love you, and I get you love me. You're so gracious. You're so forgiving. You, you're, I mean, it is out of this world, your love for me. But Jesus, you don't want me to represent you. Jesus, you, you don't want me to show up and, and be the guy that you, I mean, I messed up. I mean, worse than all, I mean, there's the, the only difference, Jesus, between me and Judas is I did it three times. He only did it once. P P Jesus, I, I, why, why don't we do this? Why don't you just quietly love me to the side? 
why don't you just keep me? I mean, I, I, don't, we don't have to talk about what I did because I don't want to hurt you, and I don't want people to think that, that you kind of, Jesus, let, just, how about this? I'll just stay quiet to the side. I, I won't represent. Find, find somebody else. Bartholomew, he's boring. Use him. He, lied, he never messed up. <laughs> and, and it reminds me of this story um, <clears throat> that I read in a business journal about a, a junior executive at IBM who um, got put in a position and, and decided to take a very risky venture on the company's behalf. He was ambitious, wanted to make big waves. So this risky venture, he took a gamble, and he lost in a single transaction $10 million for IBM. And, um, and so he got called to the office of Tom Watson Sr., who founded IBM and led it. And, um, and he walked in, and before um, Mr. Watson could even say anything to him, he held out his hand with a letter, and he said, I know you've called me in here because you want me to resign, and so here's my resignation. <laughs> and, um, and Mr. Watson kind of smiles, and he, and he says, um, you must be joking. He says, I don't accept your resignation. <laughs> um, I just invested $10 million in educating you. You got to get back out there and do your job. And I can imagine where Peter's saying, Jesus, here's my resignation. Thank you for your love. He looks at Peter and says, you must be joking. <laughs> you, you, you must have lost your mind. I don't accept that. I just invested a resurrection in you. I just, in res I just invested mercy in you. I just put all this forgiveness. I've just invested so much love in you. Get back out there. I need you. And I think that's what he's saying for you today. You are not what you have done. You are not what's been done to you. You are a child of God. And he stands here today with your resignation in hand and says, I don't accept that. I put too much mercy in you. I put too much love. I put too many gifts. I put too much calling in you. Get back out there. I need you to love. I need you to love every single person you come in contact with. I put too much in you to let you resign today. And I'll just tell you, when you receive something like that, you can't help but pass it on to other people. And that's what Peter does. Peter becomes a hallmark of this kind of love. Uh, it, one of the most famous passages, 1 Peter 4, 8, <laughs> says, above all, above all, have intense, and this is Peter's words, unfailing love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sin. You know, you know what that word unfailing means? It means never ceasing. It, 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 means, it means it's not a natural love. It's a, it's, it's, it's not, this kind of love is not the, the, the natural love. It's supernatural. This is the sort of love that is unfailing when people fail. It's, 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 it's compensating in spite of weakness. It covers the greatest of sin. It restores the most broken. It's the kind of love Peter received. Therefore, it's the kind of love Peter gave. The reason Peter writes of unfailing love is because he received unfailing love. And so the secret to loving the secret to loving someone else is to first receive God's love for yourself. And the kind of love you receive will be the kind of love you release. <laughs>